Good evening, and welcome to this evening's webinar entitled The Role of Corneal Hysteresis in Glaucoma Risk Assessment. This webinar is sponsored by Reichert. The speaker for this evening is Dr. Jim Timmons. Dr. Timmons practices at Atomic Consultants of Connecticut and is currently a clinical professor at the Pennsylvania College of Optometry and six other colleges of optometry. He has over 200 publications and is a nationally and internationally acclaimed speaker and educator. In 2002, he founded the National Glaucoma Society, which provides educational and clinical development services to primary care clinicians. Tonight, Dr. Timmons will be discussing his insights regarding corneal hysteresis. All lines will be muted during tonight's presentation, and Dr. Timmons will be addressing questions at the end of the presentation. If you are in need of assistance at any time during the call, please press zero pound on your telephone to reach an operator. I'm going to turn it over to our presenter, Dr. Jim Timmons. Well, thank you very much, and uh, good evening, everybody. So glad you could join me tonight, and uh, thanks so much to Reichert for sponsoring this uh, program. I know we're getting just to the beginning of summer, so I do appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the Memorial Day weekend coming up. This particular topic is one that's very special to me and that uh, I've been involved in the actual uh, evaluation and subsequent utilization for almost uh, four and a half to five years. So I've had a, a really interesting opportunity to view the progression of its implementation and certainly and seeing the change that it's created in my practice as regards how I interface with my patients. So I thought what we'll do is uh, talk for about 35, 40 minutes and then we'll take some questions. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting information, that's for certain. Um, and I think what we're going to talk initially about is just what is corneal hysteresis. I think many people understand what hysteresis is sort of generically, but specifically it, it is effectively the viscoelasticity of tissues. It's not just the cornea, which we're going to talk about tonight, but a number of other tissues which we've had, you know, human tissue which is involving cardiac tissue, lung, tendon, et cetera. Those all have been evaluated and have fairly decent literature to support the role of corneal hysteresis in their functional presentation. It really effectively is the difference between the loading and the unloading. I like the slide in the middle with the, with the uh, memory bed. That's the one that I think is probably most representative and one most people have a clear picture of you. Push down on that bed and it takes a certain amount of pressure to make the indentation and then as you release that rebound pressure has to return, and the return is usually slower than the down pressure. Therefore, the difference becomes the hysteresis of that material. And I think that's important to understand as we go through the corneal side of this. Um, Dr. Luce was the person who originally invented the concept of hysteresis as it relates to the cornea, and it gives us a very interesting biomechanical signature of the patient's corneal tissue. That's an important concept to stay with as we go forward because the biomechanics are not just to the person, they actually become individualized to the eye. And this is where a lot of the applicability of corneal hysteresis to the individual and the glaucoma that they present with or the ocular hypertension they present with is most important. Of interest, and I think this is one of the most um, uh, sort of well-hidden secrets in all of science over the last five to six years. Since 2010, there have been almost 1,500 publications in the area of corneal hysteresis. And for the life of me, it's hard to remember anything that jumped out until the last three or four years where some of the really big names in glaucoma research, Weinreb and DeMorris and Liebman and Rich and, you know, the big centers on the two coasts, began to look diligently at its relationship to glaucoma and found not only interesting information, but actually very vital information for our long-term utilization and practice. It's not a surrogate for uh, pachymetry. I think it's very important to sort of move off the discussion in the beginning. Corneal hysteresis and pachymetry are two different perspectives. It turns out, and I'll show you numerous studies here over the course of the next 20 or 30 minutes, that corneal hysteresis is notably more sensitive to the predictive capacities or to, its, to the prediction of progression in glaucoma patients than corneal thickness is. 
corneal thickness is an interesting element, and we do corneal thickness on our patients just like everybody else does. It's part of the equation, but I've begun to utilize corneal hysteresis in a much more informative fashion when I evaluate patients, and certainly it's one of the now important triggers to move me forward in the diagnosis and management of my glaucoma patients. So if you look, uh, this slide's a little bit busy, but basically what it says is it's really not the surrogate that we might want it to be. And in fact, corneal hysteresis was approved separately by the FDA simply because the information that's generated from your corneal hysteresis assessment is so remarkable that you don't have to go much further with your, with your evaluation of the patient than that. As I said, I still do pachymetry, but I've started to rely on it less and less because I don't think the predictive value of pachymetry is anywhere near as high as hysteresis. One of the reasons that this holds, I think, to fact is if you look at this slide, you'll see that corneal hysteresis in normal patients is literally identical across the world. There is no race that has a notably different level of corneal hysteresis. What that means is that the corneal hysteresis that becomes a lower number or a more at-risk patient clearly demonstrates patterns away from normalcy. One of the problems with pachymetry is that you can have patients in different racial areas that have remarkably different pachymetries. And as a result of that, one level of pachymetry, one single number or one group of numbers is much less capable of being applied to the whole as the as if as in contrast to uh, corneal hysteresis, so very powerful tool. The other thing that's interesting, and this is a really nice study by Kitta and the other by Fontes, shows that CCT and IOP and CH were measured every two hours in these 50 healthy volunteers. What they found was CH doesn't display a 24-hour rhythm, and CH has a notable decrease, really doesn't decrease notably with age. What's fascinating is that CCT Nocturnal IOP and CCT were significantly higher than the diurnal mean. So this shows you the stability of this measurement over time in healthy patients. And therefore, when it starts to decline, we can use that as a measure of the progression towards glaucoma. So there's just, an, uh, there's just such a large body of evidence. I've selected several key articles that I think you might find interesting. And first and foremost is the ability to look at CH and understand the relationship between that and potential progression in your existing glaucoma patients. The first study we're going to talk about for a few minutes is by Congdon, 2006, in the uh, American Journal of Ophthalmology, AJO, where he took 230 patients either with glaucoma or suspected of glaucoma. You can read through the attributed uh, assessments, but basically they had to have shown a definite worsening of the visual field over time. And then what they did was they back applied corneal hysteresis to that data, knowing those who progressed and those who didn't within this group. And if you look at the data, if you look at the presentation here, corneal hysteresis is 10 times more sensitive to identification of progression in a group of patients with glaucoma or entering into glaucoma. And what does that mean? So it means if you have a patient and all the other parameters are relatively equal, you have two patients next to each other, the one with the lower hysteresis is the one that's going to be more likely to progress within the five-year period going forward. So this gives you valuable information as to intensity of management, goal pressures that have to be set, frequency of visits, testing parameters, and other factors that are useful to you when you manage your glaucoma patients. This is another study on normal tension eyes. This was done by Park. I found this study to be really interesting. Uh, the setup for the study was that 82 of the eyes of normal tension patients were evaluated. They were all seen by a glaucoma specialist and verified that they were indeed normal tension because it can get a little cloudy if you allow open angle glaucoma patients to enter into a pool like this simply because they have not been discovered to have had an elevated pressure at some point in the past. And what you see with the data from this one, which is really interesting, is corneal hysteresis is at 0.01 predictability. But if you look at the side piece there, sort of the backstory, of the 39 eyes with low CH, 26, or almost two-thirds, showed progression of visual field, while only 13 didn't. 
Conversely, in the eyes with the higher CH, 15 showed progression, or 35%, but 65% or two-thirds did not. So just the differentiation in normal tension patients who were diagnosed with the disease prior to the application of the technology gives you a huge view of potential risk for your patients after they've already been diagnosed. And that's one of the pieces that, you know, pachymetry doesn't really help as directly because, as I said, pachymetry is this very large range of numbers which vary considerably in the normal range across races and other factors, whereas CH does not vary in normals. It only varies in abnormals. CH is associated with asymmetric glaucoma. This was one of the pieces that I read that really convinced me that this technology had to be a part of my day-to-day -day practice. I looked at this data that uh, Anand had put together and published in ophthalmology, investigative ophthalmology and vision science. It was a very impressive study. You know, they had 117 glaucoma patients with notably asymmetric fields that had been identified with HVA, or H, Humphrey visual fields, HVFs, using standard 24-2 uh, software. So at the end of the day, if you look at the data, 80% four out of five of the eyes that were asymmetric were predicted by corneal hysteresis. But if you look at corneal thickness, it was 600 times less sensitive. And you can understand that because in all of our patients, and everybody who does glaucoma treatment understands this implicitly, if that eye hasn't been damaged by keratoconus or a herpetic scar or microbial keratitis or a trauma, um, there is, or they have a basement membrane issue or fuchs, the probability of them having an asymmetric pachymetry is close to zero, less than 10 microns in almost all patients. Therefore, pachymetry can't be expected to be predictive, but corneal hysteresis was predictive 80% of the time. And I see this over and over again in the practice. We had two patients in the office. We saw a lot of glaucoma patients today in the practice, and I have several of my externs on the, on the uh, conference call so they can attest to that. And there were two patients visibly asymmetric, I mean, notably. And in both of them, the corneal hysteresis was markedly lower in the worst eye, even though the pressures were relatively the same. And this is where I think corneal hysteresis plays such an important role. So if you look at another version of the progression discussion, not only is it likely that corneal hysteresis can be used and should be used to look at the risk of a patient with glaucoma progressing, it also has been shown by Demoras in his study in 2012 in the journal Glaucoma to be a representation of the rate of progression within existent glaucoma patients. So if you look at corneal hysteresis as a predictor for rate of progression, if you have two patients with the identical other factors and one has a, they both have notable field, they both have visible field loss. If you look at the one who's most likely to progress, that's true. But if both of them are progressing, there's the second order of assessment which corneal hysteresis imparts, which is the rate of progression will be greater even though all the other factors started out the same not only will both progress, the rate will be greater in the one with the lower hysteresis. And this was a really important finding. In a yet to be published paper out of the same patient base, he has identified that the exact same thing is present in the rate of retinal nerve fiber layer loss in patients with lower corneal hysteresis compared to others with the exact same parameters already with glaucoma, already progressing. So not only is the functional testing of the patient notable, the actual structural testing of the patient is also impacted by corneal hysteresis. And that's uh, another reason that it becomes such a powerful tool. And you can see here, this is 0.01. What's really interesting is CH was so powerful in this analysis that it actually threw out CCT as a possible multivariate value in this model showing the relative inefficacy or non-efficacy of CCT in this particular setting. So, because CCT, it doesn't predict rate of progression in any significant way. Now, there's a couple of studies that I want to very briefly deal with, and this is the Diagnostic Innovations in Glaucoma Study 2014. It's from the uh, Hamilton Center, Hamilton Glaucoma Center at uh, UC Davis, or UC San Diego, 
This is Dr. Weinreb's group. This is one of the great research groups in the country. And they've done some really extensive uh, development here. And you can see the, the distribution of the actual entry values. Uh, they had 68 patients, 114 eyes. They were evaluated for six months, at six month intervals for four years. They did CH, IOP, CCT, and visual fields. And basically what they found was GAT, that's applanation tonometry by Goldman, is not correlated with CH. CH and CCT are significantly correlated, but weakly. But if you look at the statistical connection here, it's really pretty fascinating. This particular slide shows that in the multivariate model, CH was three times more likely to be associated with rate of progression than CCT. And this is almost identical to the data that we just showed you from DeMora's study. So this is a second and very, very well-respected group indicating that the value of CH is far more powerful than the value of corneal pachymetry in patients. Um, talk a little bit about hysteresis and sort of the structural issues involved. It's fascinating to me that if you look at CH as a predictor um, of, let's go on to the next one here. I want to do th this one, okay. So CH is associated with post-trab axial length decompression. So this is really interesting. This is a study by Brandt. Now, Brandt was small. It was 18. But he found that CH was correlated with reduced axial length after trabeculectomy. One might ask the question, why would that occur? Well, it turns out that CH is a measure of the biomechanics of the entire eye, and when you lower pressure dramatically, as trabeculectomy usually does, you actually change the pressure from the internal portion of the eye going out, which actually does decrease the overall length of the eye, and this, in this study, considerably, and far, far greater than uh, any other factor that was involved. So it's a, once again, a really important vehicle for us to utilize in uh, evaluating our patients. This is another study. This was by Wells. And you know, my, I, I looked at this study, and I, I read it, and then I read it again because I was so struck by the science that was involved here. What they did in this study was they looked at deformation in glaucoma, which means they looked at what happens when the pressure is elevated to a high level to the optic nerve in patients who have this disease. And here's what they found. This is fascinating. They took an old LASIK microkeratome ring, which we used to use all the time before we had intralase, and they placed that ring on the eye, and we could, they can control the pressure. It raises it up to about 64 millimeters of mercury for 30 seconds. They monitored the optic nerve surface before, during, and then after the HRT, uh, during, uh, after the IOP elevation with the HRT2, and what they did was they looked at the change in depth or the z-axis or the volume of the nerve, if you will, as this elevation of pressure took place. And what was the outcome, which was fascinating, was that the patients who had the lowest hysteresis matched almost exactly the patients that had the greatest deformation of their optic nerve. So when we first discovered pachymetry and its relationship to glaucoma in the OAT study, one of the goals of that discovery was to try to tie together why a factor, a measurement, a number on the front of the eye, i.e. the cornea, could have a relationship to the back of the eye. Quite frankly, that bow never got tied on the box, to be honest. The, we've sort of you know, started to homogenize pachymetry. We no longer look at the actual number. We say it's either low, it's medium, or it's high based on our sort of assessment. I said it varies considerably by race. You have to be very careful even looking at low, medium, high. But with hysteresis, it was found that the relationship was directly connectable. And what this means is that the integrity of the collagen of the cornea is therefore assumptively applied to the collagen at the lamina cribosa because the eye that allowed the largest deformation had the weakest collagen which is what the biomechanical signature of the cornea represents, the weaker collagen. Therefore, the two are tied together, and this is why CH has such a powerful predictive value to future glaucoma damage. This is another study by, uh, well, there's several studies here, but ONH deformability is associated with glaucoma. CH is associated with ONH deformability. CH is more associated with visual field defect than structural markers of glaucoma as measured by spectral domain OCT. 
Now, that's a pretty powerful statement because what they're saying there is that the OCT that we have is not as likely to predict visual field associated changes as the CHs. So, lots of interesting data and it certainly begs a number of really obvious questions as to where this process fits into our clinical care of our patients. So, if you look here, the ocular response addressing the corneal hysteresis issue, just kind of walk you through what the instrument looks like. There's been several iterations. I have a number of different ones. Uh, we have a research, basically one of the research versions. And the reason we got started in our practice was actually myself and my partner Eric Donenfeld were involved in the very, we, we became the very first cross-linking, open label cross-linking center in the eastern U.S. Uh, we did that probably about six years ago now. Uh, we were actually one of the principal, he was the principal investigator for the original cross-linking trial. And we decided after the trial that the, you know, the European data was so powerful that we wanted to offer this to patients even though the FDA had not yet approved it. And for those who don't know, it was approved about a month ago. So good news there. Um, but we started using it because Reichert had a program that we wanted that allowed us to look at the way that corneal hysteresis reversed itself and became stronger upon cross-linking or riboflavin, ultraviolet light, and then the reactive oxide that creates the restructuring of the corneal collagen. And that was our original entree into this. We were also measuring with the corneal compensated IOP, the IOP before and after the procedure on multiple occasions, and we were seeing that the IOP varied until it reached its, its peak a little bit, but the beauty of it was that the IOP with the gold mine was effectively eradicated. It really was wildly inaccurate in some patients. The corneal compensated was much, much closer, if not exactly the same as the pneumotonometer we were using to measure the patient. So we were, I, I was profoundly influenced by the quality of that particular analysis. And another little story that I'll tell you which was pretty fascinating and it had to do with the installation of the unit. You know, I've been practicing a long time and I do require at least one of my students to give me an annual exam. Uh, that's, that's a pretty foreboding moment for them, but they do okay. Uh, I've never had anything other than what I thought was fairly normal vision. I'm a slight myope. I'm a little presbyopic at uh, my age, but nonetheless, very straightforward exam. Um, I sat for the students to actually try out the unit, and Dave Taylor, who's the product director for Reichert for this particular uh, product, happened to be there on the installation day. And one of the comments he made to me was, he said, uh, do you have uh, keratoconus? And I said, no, absolutely not. And he said, well, the data from the, from, the, from the corneal analysis shows that your left eye might have a little bit of early keratoconus. Um, you know, why don't we check it? And we walked down the hall. We have a pentacam down the hall. We walked down the hall, and sure enough, I did an analysis, and I had form first keratoconus in my left eye. Never knew I had it. I've lived an entire life within the profession. I've had topography done many times. Um, well, I've had keratometry done many times. I hadn't had topography done. And this instrument on very first analysis caught it. And that really caught my attention because I thought, you know, if it can do that, then I am certain that the other data that it claims to be able to generate has validity. And so we've walked through this, and I'd say we've done easily 10,000 measurements between clinical trials that we've used it for and day-to-day -day patient care. So. Very powerful uh, tool. Let me go back one sec here. So you have corneal hysteresis, obviously. You have what's called a Goldman IOP, or the equivalent of Goldman. Then you have the compensated IOP, which is a very complex algorithm of measurements. One of the pieces of the puzzle that I think is quite critical is getting your technicians and, or in my case, the uh, amazing interns that work with us at the office to join in the quest for excellence. And the reason that you need this is there is a quality reading that is assigned to each and every value that's created. And if you don't have above a five, I would prefer a six, it's really hard to use the information. So in my practice, everybody gets a hysteresis done. Well, everybody gets a, a aura done first. I use the gold mod on the days and I'm simply measuring pressure. If it's a new patient or if it's a patient who's a suspect, we apply the corneal hysteresis and we'll build that. But the key is I use it to look both at the IOP, the corneal compensated IOP, 
and then also the hysteresis. And in order to get good values for all of those, you need to have your staff, who's ever going to be doing this for you, understand that it's critical to get the waveform scores at a nice level. And the wave score is that bottom element there, the WS, and this one's good because it's at 8.8. Uh, .8. So you can count on that number. One of the things I want you to notice is that the difference between the Goldman IOP and the IOPCC is very little in this particular patient. That's because the corneal hysteresis is relatively uh, high. So average corneal hysteresis was 10. 11.5 is very robust corneal hysteresis and gives you a fairly safe context of that patient at the time that you see them. So how does this work? Well, what happens is, and then many patients uh, apply the original AO Reichert system uh, name and concept to this, and that's really not what we're doing here. We're measuring corneal hysteresis. You know, we also measure IOP, which is great. So it's a air puff tonometer in that context, but it's not really air puff in the sense of the old system because this unit gives you a, a measure of the predictive values we've already discussed. And that was why the FDA approved it. I mean, they could have easily just made the device available and said, yeah, you can do IOP with it, but they gave it a billable event because of the information that's supplied by corneal hysteresis. So it works by the initial pressure being executed by the puff. And for those who haven't had a chance to try one of these and, and take it for a drive, the puff is not the old school poof that we used to have where patients would startle horribly. It's a little pff, little pff. And I use the three set, so we use boom, boom, boom. That was, there's a three that gives you a much better average. Um, and then the patients move it over to the other side. But what it does is it presses the cornea to flat. It measures it when it's flat. That's the initial pressure. It keeps, can, it continues to press until it's concave, and then it lets go and it measures the response on the return, much like that mattress we talked about earlier. This all takes place in literally a few, uh, a couple of half a second maybe or less, maybe microseconds. Patients don't even know that they've been tested other than the fact that the puff is present and you can hear it. The hear, hearing is more of a startle than the actual puff. It gets fairly close, but uh, patients don't complain about that. And my technicians are exquisitely capable at this. They've learned over time and thousands of applications. And the externs come in and learn very, very rapidly. This is not something that takes a prolonged period of training within the practice to bring to the day-to-day uh, -day utilization levels that, we, that you want. And this is kind of what the, the graph of hysteresis looks like. That initial pressure caused X. The release pressure was Y. The difference is the unique signature of that cornea and that patient, not just the patient, which we would have. And here we go. Here's a little representation. You can see that it over creates a concave and then subsequently allows it to return and measures the return to flat and that gives you the difference. Corneal compensated IOP is interesting because it is a really accurate measure, but if you look here, it's actually markedly different. Same patients, 155 patients, 102 normal tension eyes. Look at the difference between GAT and compensated IOP in your normal tension patients, most of whom have relatively low corneal hysteresis. So I think this is an incredibly valuable tool. We have a population of patients in my south office in Stanford that uh, are from Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Somalia. I'm uh, blessed to have the Bishop of the Eritrean Church of North America as a patient, and he has brought his entire congregation to my practice, I think, over the last year or so. It's incredible how thin their corneas are without having had surgery. These are not the 520s and the 515s that we see in North America in Afro-Caribbeans and African-Americans and some Spanish patients, uh, even some Caucasians. These are in the 410, 420, 430 range. They've never had surgery. So my question at the time was, you know, my Goldman reading could not be accurate, but I didn't even have a relative value to assign to it. So I started to bring them up to the north office to get a sense of the difference <clears throat> between the Goldman and the IOP adjusted, excuse me, or corneal compensated. And I was getting readings of 12, 13, 10 on the Goldman. I'd go anywhere from 17 to 22 or 23 on the corneal compensated. So it gives you that incredible separation of knowledge about real IOP versus 
the pseudo IOP that's created in a particularly thin cornea using the Goldman system. Um, there's a couple of other studies that I think are, are worthy of, of evaluation, but I'm not going to spend too much time on that. I want to talk a little bit about how to incorporate this into our practices. As I said, I started off in a very narrow band of using it as a research tool in my cross-linking center here at the office in Connecticut. And it was excellent. And then we started looking at the IOP, as I mentioned, before and after. And we wanted to measure that because that was quite critical to understand what happened to IOP with cross-linking. And with corneal compensated, I was able to get a very accurate measure, whereas with Goldman, I don't think that measurement is anywhere near as accurate as you want it to be. You know, if you look at what CCT did as an indicator for conversion from ocular hypertension to glaucoma, corneal hysteresis is much stronger in its clinical application and I think is going to advance really rapidly in the next two to five years. I mean, everybody I talk to who has taken on one of these units absolutely respects the data they're getting and they understand how to incorporate it into their practice in a very real and, I think, substantive way. Um, you can use OATS data, which is very helpful, and I think that's important, but I think incorporating corneal hysteresis is fairly simple. We talked about the Weinreb study uh, from the Hamilton Glaucoma Center saying that there's a three to one predictability of progression. We know that there's a moderate correlation between CH and CCT, but CH was a much stronger parameter relative to progression of visual field loss, and now we know RNFL loss. So a much more powerful tool. So the real question becomes, how do you put it into practice? In the beginning, and that was several years ago for me, I'm just like everybody else. I've been doing Goldman all my life. It was the standard that we're all trained on. I think we respect it as we should. I think there are a lot of issues with Goldman that we've probably kind of forgotten, uh, like you have to have it actually calibrated on a regular basis. That would be more than once every five to ten years because I talked to doctors and some people have never had it calibrated. Second, and I know you all probably know this, but I don't know how many people do it, when there's astigmatism you actually should rotate the axis of the Goldman head to match the astigmatism axis in order to get the best reading. If you don't, you can be off by anywhere from one to four millimeters of mercury. Uh, so there's lots of things within Goldman that doesn't even go, that doesn't even get into the squeezing and the watering and the fighting and the blinking. And then we come out of that with a number that we're happy with because we watched it in front of our eyes. But the cold reality is there's enough variation within that that I think it's subject to question. The beauty of this device is if you consecutively do 100 patients in your office, or even 50, and you do Goldman, and you look at the Goldman reading on this device, you will be markedly impressed with the consistency of your excellent Goldman readings with this device's Goldman readings. So what I've done is I've moved into the space where now that I'm actually measuring every patient every time, I default to Goldman when I can't get a wave score that's sufficient, when I have a data point that just doesn't make sense, and I now, I was doing Goldman exclusively on patients with very elevated pressures, above 35, 40, 50, 60. I have a subset of almost uh, 20 patients now, just short of 20, where I've looked at them for acute elevations of IOP, angle closure, uh, post-operative patients with hyphemas, or some other cause of acute elevation. And I've measured Goldman, and I've measured corneal hysteresis, and then I've measured both of them as I've treated the patient down from that IOP over time, let's say an hour, two, or three, whatever time it takes. And when you measure corneal hysteresis, even at the upper registers, which I did not expect, it is very, very similar to Goldman consistently. You know, they may vary by two or three, but when a patient's pressure is 60, two or three is such a small percentage of the overall that you're never going to miss the intention of what that cornea is telling you about the intraocular pressure. The other factor, which is brilliant, is this is a test that's done by technicians. So by the time I get in the room, either you know, one of my technicians or when one of my students is working with the patient or the externs, they actually have this information in the chart. I can look at it. I can compare it to the OCTs. I can look at the visual fields. I can look at the ERG. All the pieces of the puzzle that we bring to bear on our patients, and it helps me on a daily basis make decisions about where we want to go with today's management. There's a whole issue of a sort of assigning risk relative to intraocular pressure and corneal hysteresis. 
So low corneal hysteresis and low intraocular pressure has a relatively low risk. Low corneal hysteresis and a very high intraocular pressure has a very high risk. But when you move over to the high corneal hysteresis, it doesn't excuse the fact that the patient can have glaucoma. It just decreases the probability that that patient's risk assessment is going to require the type of immediate intervention that a lower number would tell you that you should do. So I'm going to show you one or two cases. These are courtesy of a good friend, uh, Nate Ratcliffe, and he was kind enough to create these for Reichert, so I'm going to thank him for that. These are excellent cases, and Nate's a phenomenal clinician. And he's actually one of the people who uh, presented at the National Glaucoma Society, it'll be four years ago this summer, and sort of opened the door for all of our members to start to look at this as one of the key office tools for glaucoma assessment diagnosis, and management. So we'll just walk through, I think, one case, because it's getting close to quarter till. I told you we'd finish by then. So here's a patient with a uh, tonometry of 24, CCT of 525. IOP Goldman was 23.2, so very tight match. The compensated IOP was 26.7, or close to 27, so a little bit of a difference. Then the corneal hysteresis was 6.6. .6. Now, this patient's an ocular hypertensive, and if you look, the visual field was normal. There was no predictive value over four years towards progression towards vision loss. The optic nerve, though, on baseline and then follow-up over time clearly showed a change. You can see a deepening of the volume of the cup. You can see an erosion of that inferior segment at about 6 o'clock through to about 4.30. The deflection of the vessels is different. The shadowing of the vessels and the width of the vessels is different. Clearly, the patient's notching out a little bit even though they were an ocular hypertensive to start. Here's the RNFL, and you'll note that even though both of the RNFL averages and microns are, are in the norm, there's a 20 micron difference between the two eyes. There's also a very big difference in the disc size here. If you look, one's 2.03 and the other's 2.52. Normally with a large disc, you have something that you, you typically have a more robust reading than that, well, you can have, not typically, you can have a more robust reading on the RNFL than actually exists because the T-SNIT is much closer to the margin of the Bruch's membrane opening, and therefore you have crowding of the retinal nerve fiber layers as they enter, and you have an artificially elevated presentation, which is called green disease. The RNFL looks good, but in fact it's not good. This was coined by Sanjay Azrani. He also coined the term red disease as its opposite two of the critical pieces of information about interpreting RNFL. If you look, remember, this was a 6.4, was it? 6.6. .6. That's a very low corneal hysteresis. Right there in a patient with ocular hypertension, my antenna have gone up considerably, and I am watching this patient extremely carefully due to that number. You can see here, the ganglion cell has decayed notably in the left eye. And it relatively matches the appearance of the nerve because I told you, I think there's a little bit of a green disease presentation here. That nerve's more damaged than it looked. And this all adds up to a very clear progression of disease. Now, some people might say, well, the pachymetry was low as well, and I don't disagree. And I said, I, I don't not do pachymetry. I use it, but I have become much more inclined to use my corneal hysteresis as my predictor. And this is that classic progression patient, which we talked about, where corneal hysteresis was much more likely to predict progression than pachymetry would have been for the same given individual. I think this is a really great case in that regard. And you can see here the patient shows a um, clear decline in the uh, RNFL inferior thickness and the superior thickness. So the nerve over time has shown the regression curve shows clear evidence of loss of cellular activity or axonal activity and therefore this patient has progressed within the analysis process. I look at a 6.6 .6 in a patient who has other factors, and I'm gonna see that patient not once a year, not twice a year. I'll see that patient as if they're a glaucoma patient, and I'll even run additional testing like an ERG, get a flash, get a pattern ERG on them, because data from Baskin Palmer shows that that, along with your corneal hysteresis, has the, probably the best predictive value of progression. And you can see here the patient progressed nicely. Uh, one other quick one. This is a newly diagnosed glaucoma patient with low IOPs. GAT was 10. CCT was 540. CH was 61, very low. 
uh, whereas CCT is not very low, but it's certainly you know, low enough that it would be considered in that lower register. What's interesting, though, is the IOP was 8.3, and the adjusted IOP was almost 50% greater than the actual measured Goldmine IOP. So this is a patient who I also watch. We have a big difference between the two. I think it's quite critical. You can see here the nerves are clearly problematic. Uh, big wedge defects inferiorly in the left eye, and a little less, but certainly a noticeable wedge in the right eye. And here, if you look, the left field is on the right side, and the right field is on the left side. Sorry, it's a little confusing. It looks like a bitemporal loss, but it's actually got to flip them. So they both have notable nasal steps, with the left eye being more involved, matching the visual field. Absolutely no question. The issue is, is this patient more likely to progress? And the data that we talked about earlier would tell you this patient is much more likely to progress because of that hysteritic value than the pachymetry that they presented with. And therefore, I am going to treat this patient extremely aggressively early. Uh, this is the patient that goes off to surgery for SLT relatively rapidly. I might even do a single drug trial if I don't get what I want. I'll have the patient undergo SLT because uh, Osrani showed that SLT actually stabilizes the diurnal variation in patients with glaucoma better than medication does. And it also gives a little better consistency to medication use in a patient who's at risk. But that corneal hysteresis, I think, epitomizes one of the reasons that this test is such a valuable entity. I want to quickly uh, pass through a couple of these, and then we'll get to putting it in your practice. So in the world of actual implementation, how does it work? My patients all go through a system. Uh, you probably have the same kind of process in your office where there's a pre-testing area. This is part of my pre-test. I use it with everybody. I have an IOP. I can repeat that IOP if I want to. I typically don't do it much anymore. I did in the beginning. I matched it. I watched it. I was very careful. And I wanted to make sure that I wasn't giving something away that was critical. And I found over time and thousands of measurements that that wasn't the case. It's also a great way to test the efficacy or the validity of your Goldman readings in patients where you're not getting good cooperation. Because in this device, you're probably going to get a better outcome when the patient's not uh, complementary. Downside, it is a fixed position device. So in patients who are in wheelchairs, patients who have uh, ambulatory issues, patients who have seating issues, you may or may not be able to achieve it. But that would also default your gold mount at the slit lamp for the most part. You can use a Perkins, you can use a Tono pen or other devices, and that's the appropriate uh, tool for that patient. It's not for everybody. Huge time savings for me not have to do for me to not have to do gold mount. I, I can't tell you how big this is. So. As a result of that, I think this has been one of the best acquisitions that I've put into my practice relative to my information stream regarding the patients that I'm treating and to the delivery of a service in a much more efficient and cost-effective way. So final comment, uh, this is your CPT code, 92145. It works great, and I think it's, uh, we've been paid consistently with this through Medicare and Medicaid. I'm going to let Dave Taylor make a comment about where they are on a national level because I think it's critical to understand sort of what's possible. But our, our numbers are consistent with this chart, and they are very, very robust. So the instrument has a mechanism for compensating the clinician backwards against cost, which nobody else, nothing else has. And according to hysteresis can be done more than once in a lifetime. Typically, I will do it when there's a big change. I'll certainly do it initially. And now I'm starting to do it once a year as a mechanism for watching the potential for the hysteresis to drop while all the other factors are stable. So with that, I'm going to finish. And uh, Dave, I'd like you to make a comment or two about reimbursement, and then I'll take questions. Well, thanks, Dr. Tim. It's a great presentation. I enjoyed uh, listening to it and, and learned some things, as always, like I do from you. Um, the, uh, the reimbursement is not across the country right now uh, on the West Coast. In that um, Medicare jurisdiction, they are currently not reimbursing for 92145 and also in the great state of Florida. But the rest of the country, uh, we're in the clear at the present time. And uh, 92145 is its own code specifically for corneal hysteresis. Um, and as you mentioned, it's, it's reimbursing about $16 bilateral 
and can be done uh, as medically necessary more than one time per patient life different from pachymetry. So private payers, some of them have uh, negative policies that will change over time. You know, the private payers um, make their own decisions different from Medicare and they usually drag their heels a little bit. So we are actively with our consultants and with our key opinion leader, ophthalmologists and optometrists trying to get some of the major private payers to change their mind. But the good news is, as you mentioned, Medicare uh, and Medicaid are on board in uh, most of the country, and we're working on also those regions uh, that are not currently paying it. So if anybody um, out there in the audience is interested in, in more specifics on reimbursement, you're welcome to contact uh, any Reichert representative and uh, get in touch with me, and I can help you with that. Um, that's all I want to say about that. I want to thank Dr. Timmons uh, for a great presentation, and then um, I guess we want to turn it over to the audience for any questions at this point. Doctors, if you'd like to ask a question, please press 7 followed by the pound sign on your phone now. That is 7 followed by the pound sign on your telephone keypad. Please listen for your name to be announced and ask your question when prompted. Our first question comes from Dr. Matthew Parker. Hey, Matt. Hi, yeah. Hey, Matt. Just a quick question on can you sure. use for pachymetry um, uh, and, uh, and file, file for pachymetry? Or, I'm sorry, uh, Matt, I didn't get the first pachymetry. part. I was getting a little bit of an echo there. Could you repeat yeah, that? Yeah, me too. I turned, I turned it down. Sorry. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I, I, from my understanding, this does pachymetry as well? No, this does not do pachymetry. Pachymetry is a okay. separate measurement, and you bill for that separately. Obviously, that's a once-in-a-lifetime measurement because pachymetry right. okay. doesn't change. Uh, as I said, in the beginning, I did pachymetry and corneal hysteresis, and you know, like everybody, I was a little more weighted towards the pachymetry reading, thinking that that was going to give me a better data point. Now, <laughs> with all the literature that's come out, corneal hysteresis is just a much cleaner view of the risk that your patient entertains. So I still do both, and I have it, you know, available. But the long term, I'm going to rely more on corneal hysteresis for my decision making at this point. And I think I think you're going to see that the community of clinicians who treat a lot of glaucoma are moving in that direction very rapidly. So understood. I guess the instrument I'm I'm guessing is around twenty eight thousand, just from a quick internet search. Um, you know what? I, I I'll let Dave answer that question. Dave, you want to answer that question? Because I that's not what I paid, but I'll let Dave tell you what. To <laughs> Yeah, I think I, think well, I we, paid the full, full, full price, right, Dave? But I don't think I paid that. We did, and we sell, we sell through distributors uh, like, like uh, you know, Lombard, Wallman, LPO, the, the, uh, the, the top uh, branch distributors in the U.S. And it, I'm sure they would love it if you wanted to pay them 28000 for the machine, but it actually sells for about 16250 Okay, great. And uh, you said there's, uh, you, could, you could bill uh, more than one time. Um, so is that something that you could do? Uh, for instance, we have patients back, you know, on... on you know, every three to six months to check pressures. Is that something you, know what, you Matt, check? I don't do it. I, I, I run the IOP panel, but I don't rebuild the hysteresis that often. Uh, I'm looking now, I mean, I was billing it on significant change after initial presentation. There's some new data that's being developed that may change the uh, utilization of this and that it may actually be a measure of how effective your glaucoma treatment is that once you get to the best point, the hysteresis kind of peaks. But that's not published yet, so I don't think that's a useful endpoint. Dave, any comments from your end on frequency of use across the country? I think, you, just, you know, you always want to be a little conservative with these things. Sure. Um, yeah, you know, it's the the hysteresis measurement has been shown to be a little bit more dynamic than corneal thickness, especially in patients with pathology, which is why uh, CMS and Medicare did not um, limit it to one time per patient, like like they did with corneal thickness. Um, you know, I think what most uh, users of the instrument are doing is one time per year in your glaucoma suspects and maybe twice per year in your. Uh, you know, glaucoma patients, especially in those who uh, you're more concerned with uh, and that you want to follow more closely. I mean, as Dr. Timmons said, you want to make the IOP measurement at every patient visit because of the quality of the pressure measurement, but I wouldn't advise billing for the hysteresis, you know, every three months because in reality, it's probably not going to change that rapidly. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Thank you very much. Oh, sure. 
And I All right, the question is from... Oh, go ahead. Just, Sorry, Dr. Parker. I was just saying that I'm dead. Hi. Hello. Oh, hello, Dr. Julie Gorin. Go right ahead with your question, please. Yes. Yeah, so, do you feel that in light of all um, all this information, do you feel that CH should be measured uh, pre-refractive surgery uh, yeah. because you you can't measure it? It's not reliable afterwards. Well, you know, I didn't catch your first name. What's your first name? Julie. Julie. So, Julie, that's a really good question. I actually look at corneal hysteresis. We all of our patients that go in for refractive surgery or any surgical procedure of the cornea, including cataract surgery have this done, my patients, um, and I do find that that information can be quite interesting. If you look at refractive surgery, the new data shows that there is some variation in outcome based on corneal hysteresis going into the procedure. So yes, that's a, that's a really good question. I don't think we've proven the point to the level that I can say that that number gives me this much change. But the data is out there. And if you want to just email me, my email address is jimtimmons at gmail.com for anybody that wants to email me. I'll send you copies of the PDFs for the, uh, pro, uh, the uh, references tonight. But also there, there's some really interesting data on the refractive side that I'll share with you that's a fairly lengthy discussion. But I, I think the potential is, is quite significant. So uh, that's out of Australia. Actually, there's a couple people in Australia who have done that. So Your email again? It's just my name, Jim, J-I-M, and then T-H-I-M-O-N-S at gmail.com. Okay? Thank you. Oh, sure. No worries. And Dr. Matthew Parker, I'm sorry if I cut you off. Did you have any additional, any additional questions? I did not. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. As a reminder, to queue up for questions, please press mm -hmm. 7 pound on your phone now. Mm -hmm. Dr. Timmons, you have no other questions on queue. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, if, if you're still with us. And uh, if you left early, I'll thank you posthumously. Uh, enjoy the uh, holiday weekend, everyone, and welcome to summer. I hope your weather is a little better than ours has been, but uh, otherwise, uh, we'll see you maybe at AOA or possibly at uh, Vision Expo West. So thanks, everybody, and uh, good evening. This concludes this evening's webinar. If you have any further questions or follow-up, please feel free to reply to the confirmation email you received for this webinar. Thank you for attending. Recording is now stopped. You are now in post-conference.